Hello students of Dynamics, welcome to this exam review video for the last topic that we cover in Dynamics, which is rigid body kinetics. Now you recall that kinetics is looking at the relationship between forces and motion. So because we're bringing forces and also moments into the mix, we're going to need to include free body diagrams and kinetic diagrams on every single problem in this entire set of three chapters. I want to cover the topics of Newtonian kinetics and then work energy and then finally impulse and momentum. All of them are force-based. Now this chart that I set up helps you think about the different types of tools that are available. Now just to review, this is the same chart generally that we use to analyze particle problems. And keep in mind that our Newtonian approach, which is the first line, is a force and acceleration based approach, both linear and angular uh, accelerations and then forces and also summing moments. And because of that, we can solve any problem you want with this technique. But because it's acceleration based, it can be quite a bit of work. As you, as you remember from our rigid body motion chapter we just wrapped up, chapter 16 out of the Hibbler textbook, that computing the accelerations of rigid bodies is quite a bit more work than computing the velocities. And so if you have the choice, go ahead and use these velocity based techniques basically out of chapter 18 and 19 versus the acceleration based technique out of chapter 17. But to kind of work through this table in a little bit more detail, once again, the top line here is acceleration based. It's going to be reliant here on forces and moments. That's going to show up on the left hand side of your equation. Now we can also analyze multi-body systems. It's really our choice. If you draw a free body diagram of a single body, then you're going to analyze that independently. If you draw it of a cluster of bodies in constrained motion, you can analyze them all together. I find that if you're not asked for the forces between bodies, these are typically tensions, friction forces, normal forces, then it's usually easiest to go ahead and lump this into a single body system, excuse me, into a single multi-body free body diagram um, with everything all lumped together. So moving into our specialty kinetics chapters, these two topics here, conservation of energy and also work energy, are fundamentally the same set of equations, the same overall relationships. The only main difference here is that if you have a conservation of energy, all of the forces that could have been included here, we say these are conservative forces over here. So conservative mean they're exchanged between the bodies in the system. They're not coming from the outside. If you have any of these external forces and moments, you'll need to use the work term, which we'll talk more about as we move forward. And then into the last chapter, we took an impulse momentum based approach. Now just a reminder on the difference between impulse and work. Impulse is time based, right? So if you have a force applied over time, that's likely going to be an impulse problem. Whereas if you have a force applied over a displacement, it's likely to be a work energy problem. Okay, so that time versus space is really a key um, difference between these two systems and honestly otherwise because they're both velocity based they can look really really similar but you do need to make sure you see that that difference displacement tends to be work energy time tends to be impulse and momentum so continuing to move down through our review sheet getting into kind of chapter 17 proper rigid body kinetics we started talking about mass moments of inertia now it's an important thing to notice here that there's two different kinds of moments of inertia. We have area moments of inertia versus mass moments of inertia. Now area moments of inertia are used in statics and solids. Okay, so the moments of inertia you might remember from learning in statics, those were area and volume moments of inertia. As we get into dynamics, we're using mass moments of inertia. So mass moments of inertia, the biggest or the best definition we can define them as here, I put it here as number two, the resistance to rotation of a rigid body. Okay, so if we're rotating a body, it's going to have a resistance because it has mass distributed over an area. And so this is what we're going to use in dynamics. Now, both of them actually use the variable I, which I know is a little bit confusing, but that's just the way it is. I've done a little research into that, and it just seems to be the standard that both the area moment of inertia and also the mass moment of inertia use the letter I. Now, another derivative of the 
mass moment of inertia is the radius of gyration. And the equations for the radius of gyration are down below right here. And fundamentally, the radius of gyration collapses information about both the mass and also the mass moment of inertia into one single term. Spatially, you might remember from our notes that if we took a certain lump of mass and we wanted to find its radius of gyration, we'd take this same amount of mass and we'd form it into a single ring. Okay, now in this case, we're going to look here at a mass moment of inertia about the z axis, which would be coming out of your screen. And so our radius of gyration ends up being the radius k sub z, the distance from that z axis out to that ring, where once again, both the ring and the lump of mass have exactly the same mass and exactly the same, in this case, i sub z, the mass moment inertia about the z axis. Now, spatially, you don't need to really ever probably draw this or figure out what that looks like, but that is kind of a spatial interpretation of the radius of gyration. We also got into another term called the center of percussion, and the center of percussion is the sweet spot as we hit something that it produces no relative shock at the pivot. And so the good thing about this is that you can minimize the wear on your rotational bearings if you're striking things at that sweet spot. We've also all felt this if you're striking something with a hammer and say that you hit something with the handle of the hammer versus the head of the hammer away from that center of percussion that you get this big shock up through your arm and so that's essentially as you're using a tool that's how you can feel that you struck something away from the radius of gyration and you could also try this sometime if you have some kind of a, a metal pipe or even a plastic pipe or even a wooden dowel or something and see if you can tap that on um, say a corner of a table or a desk and find that sweet spot find that place where you're not getting any shock into your wrist you'll find out if you strike something beyond the center percussion that your wrist will kind of wrote one ro wrist will rotate one direction and if you strike something closer to your hand it'll rotate the other direction you kind of get the shock in the other direction now the units of mass moments inertia are consistently the mass times the distance squared and so these tend to be in units in si units kilogram meter squared or in u.s customer units slug feet squared now there are Integral equations, if you wanted to compute your mass moment inertia from a functional definition of a shape, we did not cover that in our version of dynamics. We stuck with the parallel axes equation, which is listed here below that integral form. Keeping in mind the nice thing about moments of inertia and adding up the total moments of inertia from a bunch of different subbodies is that we're simply adding on more moment of inertia onto the centroidal moment of inertia. Now in this class, we tend to use the bar notation for the moment of inertia of the centroid. You could also call that sub G if you're calling your centroid point G. And then you're just adding on the subbody's mass times the distance squared, where this distance squared is the distance from the new axes, your desired axes, your desired point to the centroidal axes of your overall body or your subbody. It's analogous to x tilde and y tilde that we used in statics. All right, so I think that wraps it up for, for that first section in chapter 17. Now moving on to using this mass moment inertia to solve problems. And so I lumped these three sections together, 17.2 through 17.5, and I did that just because they're essentially covering the same topic. They're just covering nuances or uh, different simplifications of the overall equations. All right, so we talked about that Newtonian kinetics is acceleration-based, and all kinetics problems need a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram. In a kinetic diagram, for chapter 17, we're going to focus on acceleration terms. Okay, so your linear acceleration A, your angular acceleration alpha, the free body diagram is going to focus more on your forces and your moments. Now the signs for all of these terms, they're all vector terms, are going to come from your chosen axis system in the right-hand rule. Now the angular ones will come from the right-hand rule and the linear ones from the, directly from the chosen axis system. So just don't, don't forget about your signs, especially your signs on your acceleration terms. I think we're quite used to 
picking up the signs on our forces just because we've done that all the way through statics but now as we have those acceleration terms they also need to have their signs determined from our axis system so just don't forget on your free body diagram kinetic diagram include your axes it's a required piece all right so the most general equations we have from newton's second law sum of forces equals mass times acceleration basically telling us the sum of translational forces relate to the translational inertia which is ma and then we get into the rotational version of that equation sum of moments this one is about the centroid is equal to your mass moment inertia times your angular acceleration alpha summing your total rotational moments equal to your rotational inertia all right but when you have a body in general plane motion and you decide to sum moments about some point that isn't your centroid, you pick up what's called the kinetic moment term. Let's go ahead and switch over to an interactive that I'll talk through talking more about this kinetic moment term. So here's the interactive, which hopefully can help you better understand and to review these kinetic moments that we have if we're going to summer moments around a non-centroidal point. Now, just kind of set things up here. This is a fixed axis rotation body. We're rotating here about the lower left corner. We can see how this thing moves as I rotate it back and forth around that axis point. Now this point also adjusts the body size if you want to do that. Now we are assuming in this problem we have a one kilogram body. That just simplifies our math a little bit. So here's our centroid point, point G. Here's our other point, point P. This is the point that we're going to sum our moments around. And so first, as I change my angular acceleration, let's change it from zero into some positive value. That's positive from the right-hand rule. We'll be rotating in this direction here. And we can see we pick up a tangential component of the centroid for its acceleration. And then additionally, as I increase my angular velocity, we know that angular velocity directly influences the normal acceleration of the centroid the normal acceleration being the omega squared this value here times the distance between the fixed axis point up here to the centroid with that normal acceleration vector going back toward the center of curvature which is the fixed axis okay so these are components of the linear acceleration of our centroid now comes into play our other point over here point p and so with point P, if we're going to sum moments about that point, we know we have to deal with these kinetic moment terms, which are cross products of the distance between P over to the centroid of that object. We write this as R of G, the centroid relative to point P. And we're going to cross that into these two components, both the tangent and normal components of the linear acceleration of the centroid. So you can see in this current position, the moments coming from the r crossed into the acceleration here a g n right we cross this r into this a g n gives us negative from the right hand rule and then if we cross this distance right here r g slash p sub n so that normal distance into the tangential acceleration of the centroid we also get a negative moment from the right hand rule now if we move this point somewhere else in the body we find out that say at this point right here we get two positive moments right r crossed into the tangential component gives me positive and then r crossed into the normal coming down here toward the fixed axis also gives me positive now if i move this p point right to the middle I should be able to get these go almost to zero, basically approximating zero, basically saying that my kinetic moment about the centroid is zero, which is good. That's the reason that we can go ahead and not include the kinetic moment when we're going to some moments about the centroid. Another point of interest might down, be down here, the fixed axis point. At the fixed axis point, we can see that the influence of our normal acceleration, a g sub n, goes to zero while we still have a kinetic moment from our tangential. So if you want to play with this interactive a bit more, the link is in the description notes below this video. One more topic to touch on before we leave this kinetic moment diagram is to draw the parallel between the kinetic moments for acceleration, 
noting that these are the accelerations here of the centroid. And the momentum moments as we get into chapter 19, looking at impulse and momentum. Fundamentally, the only difference between kinetic moments and momentum moments is that kinetic moments are based upon acceleration. Momentum moments are based upon velocity. So in these cross product terms here, for a momentum moment, you'll have the R cross MV, that V being of the centroid, whereas here for the kinetic moments, we had R cross MA. Otherwise, they work exactly the same. The same R cross structure, the same adding on extra, in that case, momentum, as opposed to extra inertia, when you are focusing on summing your moments about some point that is not the centroid. All right, now that we're back from the kinetic moment, let's take a look a little bit more about specific applications of this equation. Now, I'm going to leave most of this discussion while I look at the table on the following page because it really summarizes all of these terms and shows you the exact equations. But you can go ahead and read through those and make sure that you understand all these concepts. All right, here are the different types of motion. There's also another specific video that goes through an interactive looking at each one of these images. And so feel free to look back into the Newtonian kinetics topics as you're looking for the introduction to Newtonian kinetics here for rigid bodies. So the first kind of motion we have is translation. Okay, and it doesn't matter if it's a linear translation or curvilinear translation, but we're going to have just acceleration, linear acceleration of each body. Now, reminding ourselves that this diagram, essentially the darker purple arrows are showing the linear acceleration of the centroids of different elements on this body. So if we divide this square into nine elements, and then the lighter purple arrows as we get down into those are showing the rotational component of the centroidal acceleration. Okay, so we have a combination of both of those, translational and rotational, as we get into general plane motion. So back here to the first line, translational motion. So motion here, and we've isolated actual motion in this problem to be purely horizontal. If we have purely horizontal motion, it turns out that our acceleration in the y direction would equal zero, so that all of our acceleration is in the x. And this is a recommended process as you work these problems, is to go ahead and rotate your axes for a linear motion problem so that 100% of your acceleration is in a single direction. Now, you might have to add, you know, reconcile that with the number of forces you have in various directions, but that's often what I will do. So as we take a look at our rotation equation, right, keeping in mind that the original version of this equation is sum of moments around the centroid is equal to I times alpha. Alpha is zero in this problem because we have no rotation. So we can say over here that alpha is equal to zero. Also, omega is equal to zero if we have pure translation. So then if we sum our moments about a non-centroidal point, some other point P, we do then need to include our kinetic moment term, our cross product here of that position vector from P to G crossed with the linear acceleration components of that centroid. So zooming in here a bit and then now looking at fixed axes rotation, and this is going to be about that centroid. Okay, so keep in mind here we're talking about about this middle point, the centroid, we're calling it point G. Now, if we sum our forces of a body that is rotating, in this case we're rotating positive from the right-hand rule, counterclockwise, around that centroid, because the centroid is a pin, the pin is not accelerating. Therefore, sum of forces in the X and Y are going to be equal zero because you have no centroidal acceleration of your pin. Now, if you're going to sum your moments on most of these problems, it doesn't make sense to sum moments anywhere but the centroid. So let's go ahead and sum our moment about the centroid. That equal to I bar, the mass moment of inertia about the centroid, times our angular acceleration alpha. Where that alpha in this problem, as you probably can observe, is going to be going in this direction here, positive from the right-hand rule. As we get into a fixed axis rotation about a non-centroidal point, which is this topic right here, we can see now that we're going to have an acceleration here of the centroid that's going to be based upon its rotation, right? Still this body 
is not purely translating. There's no translational component of its pin, but we are going to have a rotational acceleration component of its centroid. Therefore, we can rewrite this A bar sub T as the cross product of the alpha crossed into this position vector R of G relative to P. Just to remind ourselves, that would look like this right here because this is point G and this is my point of interest point P. So of G relative to P. And then the normal acceleration would come from our omega squared times the negative of this r vector going back toward our center of curvature. Now we do have a special equation here we can apply for our rotational moment as well as the kinetic side over here and that is if we sum our moment about this pin even though the pin is not the centroid as long as we shift our mass moment inertia to that pin then we can just express that as the mass moment inertia about that new point point p times alpha now this is not a safe assumption to do about any point that isn't a fixed axis point or an iczv Okay, so we only want to use this version here in that case. If it is some other point, then we'll get into the equation below, kind of the full equation, which deals with the overall kinetic moment. All right, so if we have general plane motion and we want to sum our moments here about our centroid, then we're going to use these same two standards, sum of forces in the x equals mass times the acceleration of the centroid in the x, same thing for the y, and then we're going to sum our moments here about the centroid equal to that mass moment inertia bar, right, which is about the centroid times alpha. And then the final case here, if we're going to sum our moments about some other point, now notice in this drawing down here that we have the most complex motion, we have our the linear acceleration of each element due to rotation varying quite a bit by location as well as the translational acceleration so fundamentally you can think that the acceleration of each one of these elements is the sum of the light purple and the dark purple components so this is the most complex type of motion and if you choose to sum moments about some point which is a non-centroidal point you're going to use I bar times alpha, and then either one or two components of your acceleration about the centroid, just depending on where your point is located. So that's the summation out front here, just saying if you have both a tangent normal x, y, however you divide up that acceleration of the centroid, make sure you cross the perpendicular components of this R vector into both of those terms. So now moving on into chapter 18 which is still looking at rigid body kinetics. It's just now that we're looking at work energy versus our Newtonian, okay? So a work energy is a velocity-based framework. As a velocity-based framework, luckily we don't have to deal with our acceleration terms, and we're gonna apply forces and moments over a distance, okay? Key terms there. If you have a velocity-based problem with a distance that a force is applied, then you wanna use work energy. Now, all kinetic problems, once again, need a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram plus an axis system. Now, in work energy, the axis system isn't as vital, but let's go ahead and include it anyways. The reason the axis system is not as vital in work energy is because work energy fundamentally is a scalar-based computational system versus Newtonian and impulse momentum, which are both vector-based computation systems. All right, so chapter 18 builds upon what you've already learned from chapter 15, which is the work energy of particles. We just need to add in some additional kinetic energy terms and also work from moments. Those are fundamentally the two additions that we look at, but we can still use our fundamental work energy equation, which is the sum of our initial energy plus our work that happens between point one and point two is equal to our final energy. Now, just to highlight the idea of this scalar equation, there are a couple of things that could show up as negative. One of the things that could show up as negative turns out to be our height. Okay, so I'm gonna come down below here. Here's one height term, right, initial height. Here's our other height term here on the right-hand side of the equation. These heights are measured to the centroid of a body, and if they're going to be below the datum that you choose, they'll need to have a negative value. If they're above the datum you choose, they're gonna need to have a positive value. Okay, and the other terms that could be negative are these in the work section right here, that external work. If you have displacement opposite your force or your moment, it's gonna be a negative work term. So friction is a classic negative 
work term. If you have displacement opposite that friction force, you'll end up with a negative work term. If you have displacement with your force or moment, then you'll have a positive work term. Now, don't forget that your spring length delta is the length of the spring when it's stretched or compressed from neutral. No change in the definition of that term. And then for multi-body systems, it's typically easiest to combine everything together. So these green summations that are out front of these terms are dealing with those multi-body systems. And so for a multi-body system, you can lump together all the energy, all the work, and take a look at that in combination. Now, looking at the kinetic energy term, we talked about needing a rotational piece. That rotational piece is right here. Instead of just 1 half mv squared, we also have a 1 half i bar omega squared. Keeping in mind i bar, the mass moment of inertia about the centroid. You'll also see that we are focused now not just on the velocity of any point on the body, but the velocity of the centroid. Okay, and so this first set here is your most classic equation or the kind of the most expanded equation now conveniently the kinetic energy of the centroid no matter what kind of motion it's in is also going to be equal to the kinetic energy of a body that has an ic now keep in mind that translational bodies don't have an instantaneous center of zero velocity but fixed axis rotation do and also general plane motion bodies also have an instantaneous center of zero velocity. And so you're also welcome to sum your kinetic energy about that point. One thing you'll notice there is that there is no velocity term because the velocity of an instantaneous center or a fixed axis pin is zero. So that can simplify some of your computations there. So bringing that together into an overall equation, we can see here, here's our initial energy term, our gravitational potential energy, our spring energy, and then our combined kinetic energy, both translational and rotational. We add to that our work. Work can come from forces dotted with a distance. It can also come from moments. Now, when you dot this moment vector, make sure to convert this theta into radians. It's the only angular system that works cannot be degrees to get the correct answer. And then we have that equal to our final energy, uh, total mechanical energy, which has the same terms as the initial. So moving forward into our last kinetic topic, which is impulse and momentum. So whereas work was a distance-based system, impulse is a time-based term, but it's still velocity-based. Okay, so key things for impulse and momentum are velocity-based happening over time. Once again, we're back to a vector system. So super important to have an axis drawn. Make sure to draw all of your signs for also your velocity terms fundamentally your momentum terms show up on the right hand side of your impulse momentum equation and then all forces in this case as we get into impulse which impulse i'll talk more about that as we scroll below but impulse being the product of forces and times or angular impulse being the product of moments and times all of those are going to have vector signs in front of them in addition to your momentum terms Okay, so impulse and momentum, all signs coming from your axis system and also the right-hand rule if they're rotational. Now, as you're looking at your impulse terms, as you draw a free body diagram, every single force or couple on that free body diagram needs to show up as an impulse term unless its motion doesn't influence the momentum of the system. Okay, so a classic case of this would be if you have, say, a block, and this block has a normal force, and let's say that it's moving to the right, so it has a friction force, and that we are pushing it here from this side. So if we took a look at these three forces and thought about which of these do impulse, two of the three do impulse. P does impulse because it is pushing over a certain amount of time, changing the horizontal momentum. We could list that here as M times V bar. The other one that has an impulse is our friction term. It's opposing that motion. So the friction force times the time elapsed. The one that doesn't have an impulse is going to be this normal force term. And the reason that there is no impulse and I'll put in a little modification here, no horizontal impulse is because it's perpendicular to this velocity vector. 
right? So it's not causing any change in momentum. And so you can think that um, in the same way that we took dot products for our work terms, fundamentally you can think about a similar operation in looking at which force terms cause impulse. Now there is no technically um, dot product for impulse because time isn't a vector and so we're not actually dotting anything but you can think that as you isolate your motion into the x directions and the y directions you'd have no x impulse from your normal force where you would have x impulse from your friction force and also your pushing force. So we also need to note that in chapter 19 that we have another moment term that which shows up on the right hand side of our sum of moments equation, basically our angular impulse momentum equation. We call this one a momentum moment. And the reason we give it a different name than the either kinetic or inertial moment we talked about in 17 is because this momentum moment is velocity based, whereas the kinetic inertial moment was acceleration based okay so kinetic inertial was r cross m a where r and a are vectors the momentum moment is going to end up being r cross m v but besides that difference between the velocity and acceleration they work in the same way they're both cross products they both have essentially the same influence on the overall problem and we'll look at those as we move below I'll let you read these last three points. They're important, but I don't want to belabor them here at this point. All right, getting here into our equations. As we look at our linear momentum, our linear momentum is the product of our mass and the velocity of our centroid. Once again, we have no choice but to look at the velocity of the centroid. If we have a non-centroidal velocities, we need to shift those to the centroid using some of our tools from rigid body motion. And then as we look at angular momentum, angular momentum is the product of the mass moment inertia. This time, not times alpha, like the angular inertia was, but this is going to be I bar times omega. And so if we are finding our angular momentum about a non-centroidal point, here is that momentum moment we talked about, R cross MV. Now bringing together our momentum terms up top here with our impulse, so our impulse is right here in the middle, it also shows up down below here. All three equations for two-dimensional impulse momentum have the same fundamental form. We have initial momentum, we add on or subtract off some impulse that results in our final momentum. We can do this for single bodies. We can do this for multiple bodies. Once again here, we have some green summations out front if you're thinking about using this for multiple bodies. So in a linear sense, we can look at the velocity of the centroid. Once again, this is the isolated X version of the equation. Below it is the isolated Y version of that equation. Initial momentum plus our impulse equal to our final momentum. We can do the same thing for our angular motion. We have our initial angular momentum, which if we are focusing here for our impulse term about the centroid, then we can use our mass moment inertia about that centroid. But we need to be consistent across this entire equation about using mass moment inertia about the centroid, summing moments about the centroid, and also then for our final momentum, once again, our mass moment inertia about the centroid. For the angular pieces of the omegas, it doesn't matter if you're talking about of the centroid or about some other point, because we know that omegas are constant for an entire body. But do note that the signs on all three of these terms, including the signs on these omega vectors, need to come from the right-hand rule. Okay, signs from the right-hand rule for all terms. If you choose to find your moment, your impulse term here, about some point that isn't the centroid, then we add on these momentum moment terms. We still need to add on the angular momentum of the centroid plus a shift in that angular momentum from the momentum moment. And we do that on both sides of our equation. Well, that wraps up my exam review for the three different rigid body kinetics topics that we covered in dynamics. The first of those being Newtonian. Newtonian is acceleration based. It'll work for any problem, but for rigid body acceleration, if the motion is very complicated, you'll recall that you can get into a lot of work just to figure out what the accelerations are before you ever even touch the forces and the relationship between those. The two simplified versions are going to be 
work energy and also impulse momentum. The nice thing about both of these techniques is that you can ignore a bunch of the motion related stuff that's happening between initial position and final position. And essentially the only thing you need to worry about happening between initial and final is going to be for work energy, it's gonna be your work. So force times distance. And then for impulse momentum, it's going to be your impulse, which is forces times time. Of course, those are both for the linear terms. And you also have angular moment times angular displacement for angular work, and then also the moment times time for your angular impulse. But once again, that's you can ignore all the motion happening between, and then also just think about the velocities, right? Which velocities are quite a bit easier to look at. So the only topic of these that could be instantaneous tends to be new Newtonian. And so if you're given a problem that doesn't give you space, doesn't give you time, and also another big clue is asks you about acceleration, you're gonna go ahead and use your Newtonian approach. If you have something happening over a distance, you're gonna to tend to use work and energy and happening over a amount of time, impulse and momentum. I hope this helps you clarify these in your mind, work through a good number of practice problems where you can practice on these. I would encourage you not to spend a whole bunch of time rereading your notes, rereading the textbook. I think your time is best spent working new problems that you haven't seen before. Give yourself a limited amount of time to work on those. If you can't solve them, find a solution, determine where your hangup is, and then go try another problem. Okay, kind of gamify your studying. I appreciate all your effort in studying for this upcoming exam, and I hope you're having an awesome day.